Today's episode of Thinking in English is proudly sponsored by Lingoda, the incredible online language school. I've been working with Lingoda for almost a year and I think they are the perfect language school for Thinking in English listeners. Already, so many of my listeners have signed up to Lingoda's sprint challenges and courses and had incredible results. Lingoda offers classes in a variety of languages, including English and Business English. They have qualified teachers online 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And the best part, the reason I love to work with Lingoda, is their sprint challenge. Lingoda's language sprint challenges are 60-day intensive learning courses designed to help you build daily language learning habits. You can either take the sprint challenge where you take 30 lessons in 60 days and if you complete it, you get 50% of your money back. Or if you're really committed, take the super sprint challenge with 60 lessons in 60 days And if you're successful, you can either take 50% of your money back or 60 credits in free classes. If you want to challenge yourself to learn English, if you want fast progress, and if you want to build studying habits, take the Lingoda Language Sprint. And thinking in English listeners can get €20 or $25 off the sign-up cost by using my code thinking20. That's T-H-I-N-K-I-N-G 20. Or click the link in the episode description. Hello, I'm Tom Wilkinson and welcome to the Thinking in English podcast, a podcast for intermediate to advanced level English learners. Tea is the second most popular beverage in the world, just behind water. How much do you know about the history of this delicious drink? Join me today for a discussion on the history of tea, from mysterious and mythical Chinese emperors to a Portuguese princess in London. At the same time, we'll learn lots of new and interesting words while testing your listening skills. You can find the full transcript for this episode over on the Thinking in English blog. The link is in the description and it's free. Here is today's vocabulary list. Beverage. Beverage. A drink, especially one other than water. For example, customers can choose from a wide variety of beverages, including coffee, tea and fresh juices. To steep. To steep. To soak in a liquid, typically water, to extract flavours or to soften. For example, the tea leaves need to steep in hot water for a few minutes. Infuse. Infuse. To introduce flavours or qualities into a liquid by soaking or steeping. As in, the chef decided to infuse the olive oil with herbs to enhance the taste of the salad dressing. Medicinal. Medicinal. Having properties or qualities that are beneficial for health. As in, many traditional cultures believe in the medicinal properties of certain herbs and plants. Dynasty. Dynasty. A series of rulers from the same family. As in, the Ming Dynasty is known for its cultural achievements and influence on art and literature. Blend. Blend. A mixture of different elements or substances. For example, the chef created a unique spice blend. Oxidation. Oxidation. The chemical reaction that occurs when a substance reacts with oxygen, often causing a change in colour. For instance, the browning of an apple 
when exposed to air is a result of oxidation. As a British person, I drink a considerable quantity of tea every week. Tea is the national drink of the UK, and when I'm at home in England with my parents, I'll usually enjoy at least five cups of tea every day. This will usually be English breakfast tea, which is a blend of black teas, served with a splash of milk. While I no longer live in the UK, I do still drink a lot of English tea. My local department store here in Japan sells PG Tips, a popular brand of British tea, so I have a regular supply. I also drink a variety of other teas here in Japan. Green teas, barley teas, jasmine and oolong teas, and herbal teas. A friend of mine from Taiwan recently gave me a few cases of high quality Taiwanese tea, so I've been enjoying that as well. Tea is a big part of my life. It's something I enjoy drinking, whether it is a comforting cup of English breakfast tea in the morning or an interesting pot of Chinese green tea. As a person who enjoys tea, I'm ashamed to say that until relatively recently, I knew very little about its history. Who was the first person to think of putting a leaf in boiling water and then realize it tasted good? You could do this with hundreds of different leaves from various plants and it would taste bad, but somehow tea was discovered. Today, I'd like to take a look at the history of tea. We'll discuss its early history in China and eventual spread around the world. We'll look at how tea culture has changed and how it became the national drink of England. And then we'll discuss how tea is enjoyed around the world. But first, there is a basic question I'd like to think about. What is tea? This is not necessarily an easy to answer question. There are many products out there which are not technically tea, but describe themselves as tea. So let's take a deeper look. The Britannica Encyclopedia defines tea as a beverage produced by steeping in freshly boiled water the young leaves and leaf buds of the tea plant. Those leaves and buds from the tea plant are also referred to as tea. In other words, tea comes from the leaves of the Camellia sinensis plant. This is an evergreen, subtropical plant native to Asia but now grown globally. The different varieties of tea, including black tea, green tea, oolong tea, white tea and pua tea, all originate from the leaves of this single tea plant. Through different growing conditions, climates and processing methods, it's possible to create a massive variety of tea from the single plant. The tea plant thrives in loose, deep soil, preferably at higher altitudes and in subtropical climates. There are different types of tea. Now, I don't mean beverages made from tea, we'll discuss that later, but the tea leaves themselves. Five of the main types include black tea, which is made from fully oxidized leaves. Black tea boasts a bold and robust flavor profile, often accompanied by fruity or malty notes. Examples of black tea include Assam, Darjeeling and Earl Grey. Green tea undergoes minimal oxidization. It maintains a light and grassy character with hints of vegetal notes. Oolong tea is situated between black and green tea in terms of oxidation. Oolong tea offer a wide range of different flavours, 
from floral and creamy to fruity and earthy. White tea is known for its minimal processing, and it has a delicate and subtly sweet flavour. And there's also pua tea, which is aged and fermented. They're available as raw or ripe, and they boast an earthy and rich profile that improves with time. On the other hand, there are lots of different products often called tea, which are not made from the tea plant. Tisanes, which is a French term meaning herbal infusion, include dried flowers, fruits or herbs steeped in boiling water. Notable examples include chamomile and fruit teas. While these are enjoyed globally, it's essential to recognise that they are not true teas. In some countries, for example, the term tea is legally reserved for products of the tea plant, Camellia sinensis. Herbal teas like chamomile and peppermint have been enjoyed for a long time though. They were often used to treat illnesses and sicknesses. Rebois tea, or red bush tea, comes from South Africa and became popular during World War II. Most of the world could no longer access Asian teas, so an alternative was searched for, and rebois, a caffeine-free plant, was a popular choice. And yerba mate is another beverage that many listeners in South America will be familiar with. This is an incredibly popular drink in places like Argentina, Uruguay and Paraguay, and is often referred to as tea, despite not being related to the tea plant at all. So now we know what tea is, let's discuss the history of the plant and drink. The earliest known references to tea drinking come from China. According to legend, a mythical Chinese emperor who lived 4,000 years ago, known as Emperor Shen Nong, was known for his habit of boiling water before drinking it to ensure its purity. One day, while resting beneath a wild tea tree, a gentle breeze carried several leaves from the branches into the boiling water. Shen Nong was intrigued by the aroma, which is the smell. Rather than throw away the water, the emperor decided to taste it, and inadvertently discovered the refreshing qualities of the beverage that we now know as tea. The legend says that Emperor Shen Nong began to explore the medicinal properties of tea leaves. He apparently recognised its ability to alleviate illnesses and promote well-being. And this was the start of China's embrace of tea and the development of tea culture. Now, this story is precisely that, a story. We don't know if there is any truth at all in the legend of tea's origin. Shen Nong, for example, is a mythical emperor who is also considered to be a godlike figure and may have not really existed. Another version of the legend, as well, states that Shen Nong was poisoned after trying over 70 different herbs at the same time, and while he lay dying on the floor, he decided to try the final leaf in his hand as his last act. As soon as he put the leaves, the tea leaves, in his mouth, they immediately saved him from poisoning. Shen Nong then named the leaves Cha, meaning examine, which is still one of the common names for tea in China and around the world today. But what is the real story? What is the real history of tea? Well, tea plants are native to the southwest of China, including parts of Tibet, and also in some other parts of the region as well, including northern India. It is possible that people living in these regions may have used the leaves of the tea plant in cooking, or chewed the leaves, but we don't know. If we look at historical records, it certainly seems like China is the first place to use tea as both a medicine 
and an enjoyable beverage. The Zhou Dynasty, starting about 1000 BC, is said to have drunk infusions of leaves, which could have been tea. And we know for certain that the Han Dynasty, which existed about 2000 years ago, used teas in medicine. During the Tang Dynasty, so about 1500 years ago, people were drinking tea for pleasure and enjoyment at social occasions. There is an early book from China called The Classic of Tea, which was written around the year 760 and talks about how tea drinking was very common at that time. The book details how tea was grown and prepared and also discusses things like tea ceremonies. Another piece of evidence showing that tea was very popular at that time in China is that the Tang government started to tax tea. Importantly, tea was quite different from what you imagine today. It was not served in convenient bags like in most Western countries and it usually wasn't drunk in the loose leaf form common in modern Chinese tea drinking. Instead, tea was pressed into tightly packed blocks, then dried and then ground into a fine powder. Hot water was added and the beverage was drunk. We can actually still see this technique today. Japanese matcha tea, which is powdered green tea, is very popular around the world and based on the old Chinese customs from over 1000 years ago. The first tea that would be widely recognisable to modern drinkers came during the Ming Dynasty. Rather than powdered tea, they started steeping whole leaves of the plant in hot water. These leaves were dried and heated to stop them from oxidising or reacting with the air. While modern tea drinking may have started in China, it spread a long time ago and is now enjoyed around the world. Around 1000 years ago, Japanese monks who had studied in China brought tea plants and seeds back home after they had finished their education. Tea plantations began to appear in isolated monasteries, but tea drinking didn't really become popular in Japan until the 13th century. As I mentioned before, the most popular form of tea at that time in Japan was matcha, powdered green tea. In the 17th century, the newer method of drying and rolling whole leaves of tea also made its way to Japan, and this eventually developed into sencha, one of the most popular forms of Japanese tea today. China was also connected to Central Asia and the Middle East, by the famous Silk Road. Tea became one of the commodities sent along the trade route and was known by people in that region a long time ago. The Portuguese and the Dutch, however, are probably responsible for spreading tea to Europe, most of Africa and other parts of the world. In the 16th century, Portuguese traders and missionaries were living across Asia and brought back small amounts of tea on their travels. By the early 17th century, the Dutch, so people from the Netherlands, had taken over a lot of trade in Asia and began commercially shipping tea to Europe, stopping at various ports in Asia, India and Africa on the way. There is actually a really nice way to see if your country or your culture got tea from uh, the, sel the Silk Road or directly from China or if your country received tea through European traders. You just have to think about the phrase tea if by sea, cha if by land. If you look at almost every language, there are basically just two different ways to say tea. In Mandarin Chinese, tea is called cha. This is the same in Japanese, ocha, and Korean, as they received tea from early trade with China. Cha was spread via the Silk Road. Although the pronunciation may be different, chai, 
Che, Shai, She. Languages including Persian, Arabic, Urdu, Swahili, Turkish and Russian base their word for tea off the Chinese word cha. And this means they most likely got tea from the land trade and the Silk Road. Not all of China speaks the same language or dialect, however. In the province of Fujian, they speak the Minnan dialect, also common in Taiwan and parts of Southeast Asia. In Minnan, they don't say cha, they say te. Fujian is a coastal region and was home to the main Dutch trading port out of China. In fact, the Dutch had major ports in both Fujian and Taiwan, which had recently become home to thousands of people from Fujian as the Dutch needed people to farm the island of Taiwan. So this te pronunciation became the word they would use for the product they shipped around the world. The Dutch took this te to their ports in Indonesia, giving the Javanese word te. On the way to Europe, they stopped in Sri Lanka, which also uses te, and in South and West Africa, meaning many languages in these regions use a term like tea or te or te. And eventually, tea became the main word in Western European languages, including English. There is a prominent exception, however, the Portuguese, who had traded with Asia before the Dutch and had their base in Macau, not in Fujian. They used the cha pronunciation, which they got from Macau, which is why, out of most Western European languages, Portuguese is the only one not to use T or T. As a British person, I feel like I should also mention how tea became the national drink of the UK. Compared to the rest of Europe, Britain was actually a little slow to join the culture of tea drinking. Coffee houses were common in London in the 16th century, but tea was still little known. However, when King Charles II married the Portuguese princess Catherine of Braganza, things changed. She was a tea addict, someone who loved drinking tea, and she brought this culture to the wealthy upper class of England. Tea remained incredibly expensive and was taxed at a very high level, meaning it could only be enjoyed by the wealthiest Britons. While China had always been home to most of the world's tea farms and plantations, the East India Company, a British trading company, decided to start growing tea themselves in India and also in Sri Lanka. In the 1850s, the British government took control of India from the East India Company and the trade in tea became much easier and more affordable. Once tea was being grown in the British Empire rather than in China, it quickly became the national drink of England. During the Industrial Revolution, companies began offering tea breaks to workers. And at the other end of the social spectrum, Anna, the Duchess of Bedfordshire, is credited with starting the tradition of afternoon tea. So let's end this episode with a brief description of some of the different ways of enjoying tea around the world. Chinese Gongfu Tea Gong Fu tea or Kung Fu tea literally means making tea with skill and is a traditional way of preparing the drink in China. It involves the brewing of tea, usually in small teapots, emphasizing multiple short infusions to bring out the nuanced flavors of the leaves. So compared to mass produced teas, this tradition uses larger amounts of higher quality tea that is ste steeped in water for a much shorter time. The tea can be steeped in water multiple times before the flavour becomes weak. So you can sometimes have 8, 9, 12 cups of tea from one serving of tea. 
Taiwanese bubble tea. Taiwan's contribution to, or one of their contributions to the global tea scene, is the delightful bubble tea. Originating on the streets of Taipei, bubble tea combines tea, milk, and chewy tapioca pearls. It is drunk through an oversized straw and has become a global phenomenon. When I lived in Taiwan, I definitely enjoyed a lot of bubble tea, but actually, most often I would order bubble tea without the bubbles. Japanese matcha. I've talked about the Japanese matcha tea a few times already in this episode. The preparation and drinking of matcha is almost like a ritual. Matcha is made from green tea leaves grown away from sunlight in the shade. It is then ground into a powder and whisked with hot water into a froth. English breakfast tea. English breakfast tea takes an important role in many British people's daily lives, including my life. It is a black tea blend, often accompanied by milk and sugar. Whether enjoyed with scones and clotted cream as part of a cream tea, or as a comforting start to the day, English breakfast tea is something common across the country. Masala chai. Masala chai is a flavorful blend of black tea infused with spices such as cardamom, cinnamon, ginger, and cloves, and is a staple across parts of South Asia, including India. It's served hot and often sweetened with milk and sugar, and is really, really delicious. Tibetan butter tea. One type of tea I've never tried, but has always intrigued me, is Tibetan butter tea. Butter tea is a unique concoction of strong tea, yak butter, so butter made from the milk of a yak, salt, and occasionally milk. It is traditionally prepared in churns and poured into bowls, and I really want to know how it tastes. So here is today's final thought. After listening to today's episode, hopefully you know a little more about tea. We started by discussing the definition of tea. We looked at where tea comes from and the differences between real teas and infusions. We discussed the ancient legends about the origins of tea and its early popularity in China. We talked about how tea spread around the world to Japan and Korea, to the Middle East and to Europe, and I mentioned how it became the British national drink. And I ended with a brief introduction. Of a few famous versions of tea around the world. Personally, I love to start my day with a nice cup of English breakfast tea. I also love to drink some tasty and skillfully made Chinese Gongfu style tea, and I have a lot of nostalgia about drinking Taiwanese bubble tea on the streets of Taipei. But how about you? Do you like tea? How do you like to drink your tea? What is the most common way of drinking tea in your country? Do you serve tea with milk or sugar? Do you、uh, like green tea or black tea? Let us know by leaving a comment on Spotify. You can comment on the Thinking in English blog, or you can reach out to me on Discord or Patreon. They're the two best places to contact me. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you all next time. Goodbye.